So uh, if you don't know Dr. Alejandro Rudy yet, um, he is the composition professor at UNC Greensboro, where I had the honor of <laughs> where I had the honor of going to uh, get my master's degree in music composition. And uh, he was an incredible professor, teacher, mentor, and still is. So um, I would like to introduce him and let him tell him about tell you all about himself. All right. Well, thank you, Elizabeth. It's so great seeing you all. Um, and uh, here we go. Uh, the topic is, it took me 20 years to get my style. And it might take you 20 years to get your style. And what I'm going to get at is why that is. And the first um, thing is we're going to talk about well, what is style in a way, or what is the personal voice? Uh, a second, we're going to go through some examples of a couple of composers who have a very clear, distinct voice. Then we're going to, I'm going to show you very quickly how in those long 20, long 20 years, uh, um, uh, the, 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 I managed to get a style or something that ap appears to be as a style. Yes, thank you, Lancy. And um, after that, you know, I'll show you a few things. But but this is this is a topic that's way more complex than what it normally appears to, because everybody tells you, look, yeah, we're going to help you come up with a, um, with your own voice and and and, uh, but nobody tells you why or no, not why, but how. How are you going to develop your own voice? What is your own voice? You know. So let me start with a little bit of a quiz. Right, so I will share a, a, my sound only. I'm sharing my computer sound. So. Um, th those who have studied with me know this routine because I've d I do it every year. So can you please, uh, if also, always feel free to interrupt, uh, talk and tell me, ask, uh, you know, it, uh, let's, let's do it informal. So can you please, anybody tell me um, um, who composed this? <laughs> Almost it's Ludwig van Beethoven, Beethoven Symphony 3. Agreeing, people? People, do you agree? So you're telling me that I show you two seconds and you tell me the style of something. I was a long, lifelong uh, Schen Schenker believer and that shakes my beliefs to the core. <laughs> <laughs> so it's not about structural integrity, it's not about harmonic progressions, it's it just somebody playing a chord and that's all all you need i mean that's insane how about this one oh let me do this one example one and what's the difference with this it's led yes. zeppelin's when the levy breaks which one the second one you played. And what happened to the first one? Um, you compressed it or something, I believe. So, uh, no, it's it, one is a finale drum <laughs> and one is John Bonham, right? Uh, yeah. But they are exactly the same. Uh, so it's not even the rhythms. It's not even the patterns. It's just the sound. There is something in the DNA of these artists that when we just hear it, we know it, right? Let's, this is a, a bit harder. Let's try this one. What is that? If you know the literature, I, I, won't, I won't delve too long. If you have a guess, go for it. Otherwise, I move. Oh, I shall... the wrong? No, it's Mahler, Mahler fifth. And how about this one? Dead 
C La Mer. That's correct. That's the Debussy La Mer. That's one dominant ninth chord with a roll of the harps and a trill in the, in the violins. You know, that's how you do a dominant ninth chord, according to Debussy. Uh, so now I have a few other things that are a little bit outside, uh, you know, the, the, the uh, tradition, uh, the, the classical tradition. How about this one? You. Who's that? It's Frank Sinatra. That's Frank Sinatra. Okay, that's all we needed to know to see that that was Frank Sinatra. How about this? Daft Punk? Well, it's close enough. It's the Chemical Brothers. That's right. Oh, that's Rush. <clears throat> Rush. Anybody else? Frank Zappa. Anybody else? That's Shethra Tool. Okay, but it's close enough. And how about this? And and you know this delves on 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 you've been familiar with the repertoire. That's uh, um, uh, the Rolling Stones, um, etc. 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 Uh, how about this one? Bartok. Uh huh. Well, that's. That's Stravinsky. If you don't know Stravinsky's string quartet, it was like a uh, like a re rediscovery for me. How about this one? The Reich. That's Reich. Correct. That's uh, that, that uh, Steve Reich. And the last one. Is that Zanakis? No, but it's Boulez. Um, yes, yes, yes. I hear somebody in the chat said uh, Boulez carrying. That's good. That's good. Uh, look, so this this brings us to something to something very important. Um, we need to understand what reality is, and what reality is for us in music composition. So I will start with something about reality in general. And, and I'll get you this one minute clip from um, uh, James Burke's uh, the, the, the Universe Changed. Let me get to share the screen. One second, please. All right, so you see that screen? It's like a YouTube thing. Okay, so listen to this, it's one minute. Let me tell you a joke. Somebody apparently once went up to the great philosopher Wittgenstein and said, what a lot of morons people back in the Middle Ages must have been to have looked every morning at what's going on behind me now, the dawn and to have thought that what they were seeing was the sun going round the earth. Well, as every school kid knows, the earth goes round the sun, and it doesn't take too many brains to understand that. To which Wittgenstein replied, Yeah, but I wonder what it would have looked like if the sun had been going round the earth. Point being, of course, it would have looked exactly the same. You see what your knowledge tells you you're seeing. Well, that's what this series is going to be about. How, what you think the universe is, and how you react to that in everything you do, depends on what you know. And when that knowledge changes, for you, the universe changes. All right. So, how does that apply to us, right? Well, let me get you a, um, a, another one minute this time from a podcast on new music, which is called Meet the Composer. It's a wonderful uh, podcast. Um, let me share sound with you. All right. Uh, and now let me find the clip. Here we go. 
This is about the um, mid 20th century uh, uh, aesthetic discussions within the American new music scene. It's a minute again. So this conflict, it actually had the tenor of like a Facebook political argument or something. There's a lot of people saying a lot of nasty things, but this was, you know, before social media. So these arguments were happening at concerts, in the classroom, and in the paper. In 1988, the New York Times published an article titled Charles Warrenin's Bleak View of the Future. Charles Warrenin is a very successful and very good chromatic composer who, in the 1980s, was alarmed at where he saw classical music heading. He thought it was evolving into pandering entertainment, designed to sell instead of to challenge. The mainstream has become totally regressive. Whether it is a mainstream of appeal to uh, sort of the world of pop music in some sense, or the yearning for the for the success and notoriety or fame, if you call it that, the celebrity that uh, practitioners of popular music, if they're successful, can achieve or a kind of nostalgia for a past which cannot be recovered. So David Lang, a tonal composer, can't resist the urge to comment. And because it was 1988, he wrote a letter to the editor of the Times called Body Count. We had just started Bang on a Can, which was, so we were in a polemical kind of mood. And I think he felt that um, that this world that he was helping to build, you know, this this um, the thousand year Reich of modernist music, was crumbling. He basically had nothing good to say about anyone else. All right. So um, what what we get is that the discussion is not about technique. The discussion is about an idea of music and an idea of music that is rooted in a reality and a view of reality but um, i i should uh, you know i should tell you um, there are other uh, readings that are interesting one is by uh, david eagleman who's a neuroscientist who tells us that you know essentially we don't uh, act on reality consciously, um, and Donald Hoffman that says that basically reality is not even a thing. That, um, this that this uh, time space continuum basically is an interface for us to operate, but that, that has nothing to do with reality. So, long story short, we need to think what music is, and we need to think what is of value in music as we understand it, to guide not only our aesthetic um, um, view, but also our technique. So let me get now into um, one composer that really has a great identifiable uh, sound, and that's Stravinsky, right? I hope you're familiar with, with, with much of the work of Stravinsky because it's a very interesting case. So um, let me, I made a playlist of every single piece by Stravinsky. And how did, the question is, how did Stravinsky find his voice? Because that's going to help us. How do we find ours, right? So this is his Opus 4. <laughs> It's not Opus 4, I think it's Opus 2. Uh, that's a piano sonata in the style of Brahms, basically, right? So we know that then Stravinsky didn't have what his style is. But what, what is his style? Can, can, can you get some some input here? Um, yeah, go ahead. I said one of the, uh, I don't know uh, entirely, but I know one of the elements is how he combines uh, the diatonic scales with the octatonic scales. Mm -hmm. that that is it that is one signature aspect of his style okay um somebody else oh uh, additive construction one. additive construction oh yes i hear also i i read also melodies built with this within the span of a fifth and his style or not this his style or his voice uh 
oftentimes I put Stravinsky in with um, vapid bursts of energy and dance-like qualities as well. All right, all right, perfect. Can you hear me now? Yes, okay. So um, uh, those things are, are all true. Uh, I tell you, I'm not an expert in Stravinsky, but I can tell you uh, what I found useful for me. At some point he starts, because if you, if you think of, uh, of uh, traditional uh, 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 classical and romantic music, what drives the music is the harmony, right? What decides when you arrive to the second point in the sonata is not whether you come up with a new tune, but whether you, you arrive to a new key. So what, what Stravinsky does to me that, that is essential is decoupling the harmony from the drive of the, of the music. And he's doing that sometimes by you know, doing ostinati or by not linking the melodies to how the harmonies work. Um, and I don't know, uh, uh, when you get to Feu uh, d'Artifice, He starts, you know, doing the things that you see, uh, seeing, uh, doing in, you know, later. Where, where something else is driving the music, but not the harmony. And he uses short folksy tunes that are not dependent on how they are harmonized. You know, and then we go, you know, right of spring. Right. I, I'm sorry, am I the only one not hearing any music? Oh. Wait, you're not hearing the music? Oh, that's correct. You're not hearing I'm the not music. Hearing it either. Oh, come on. Sorry. When I got disconnected, um, I needed to reshare computer sound. I'm so sorry. There you go. Now you should hear it. So this is for the You hear it? Yeah. Okay, so hold on. Wait a second. I don't want to share screen. I want to share sound only. Here we go. And now that thing not unlike what you right? sorry and what you hear in right of spring string quartet <laughs> Histoire. 
and then we have this big shift in which he goes into, into um, a neoclassic thing. And that should be the end of Stravinsky's style. He goes into neoclassic works uh, where the, 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 the music proceeds as in classical, uh, first Baroque, then classical music, then romantic, but yet it sounds like Stravinsky. So what does he do? Well, to me, you know, he found a way inside that large style that is the equivalent of the calligraphy. Like, for example, if we all say, if we all write, uh, my name is Donald, right? Uh, uh, we all write it with different handwriting style. So it is not what we say, it is not the big aesthetic discussion, what creates the identity, it's the small way of how we write that M and that type of thing that, you know, calligraphers would, uh, would discover who wrote something, not for what it is said, but for how it is done. Um, um, let's move to the second composer. I mean, I have like 25 other examples, but that would take us to seven o'clock, um, in which you all know uh, Steve Rye, right? So, uh, one piece. <laughs> That's read phase, right? And then the next piece. Which is piano phase. And then the next piece. Come on. Which is violin phase, which starts. Now, 25 or 40 years later, he's doing this. So what is very interesting, and I really would encourage you all to do this, get, listen to all Steve Reich in order and see how his thought process was to, well, he was interested first in phase and he did it not once, but five times, first with tapes, then with instruments, and gradually he was perfecting it until he added one other element, and then he added the, the African patterns element, and then he started uh, adding the voices and the, the, the slow harmonies, and by the end of a bunch of pieces, 20, 30 pieces, there is a solid, really big body of consistent work that is not the same, but it, it goes in some sort of direction. Now, my question to you is, let's imagine that, that um, um, Reich's thought process was exactly the same, but the elements with which he composed would be different. Uh, what do you think the result would have been? Come on in. Yes, please. The, do, do, you, do you get the question? Okay, so let's imagine. Yeah, he, let's imagine he still started working with phase music, but instead of doing diatonic, pentatonic, small fragments, he would do it with some other elements, but still phase and still music as a process. Would the music of Reich be different? Sure. Substantially, yeah, it would be substantially a different experience. So again, like in Stravinsky, we need to separate the two levels. One is the surface of the music, where the big ideas are, and underneath is the calligraphy, the way he operates those ideas, which is where, in my belief, that's where music is, right? So, um, and that's why we can understand neoclassical or late or, or, or old Stravinsky, and we still understand it as Stravinsky, even though it sounds nothing like his earlier music. So, let's go now to, um, well, uh, I'll tell you how I did it. Not that I, you know, 
how I achieve this level of uh, uh, notoriety, right? which is terrible, but <laughs> uh, no Nobel Prize for me. But um, I made a very quick uh, video showing how one thing at a time I was, I, I was moving my music, changing based on A, what my conception of music was, and B, what I thought the technique used to be. So let me start with, let me share the screen now. And you should see something like uh, Alejandro Rotti, University of North Carolina, et cetera, et cetera. Is that correct? Yes, okay. So I'll start playing. And the thing is, at this particular point uh, in the first piece, I wanted to just do only melody, no harmony, no layers, no anything. And I wanted it not to be too silly. Um, and the ideology behind it is the composer must have a proprietary technique that is novel and unique, right? So. I have to come up with my own procedures, right? So and this is the first one. Wait, am I sharing? Yes. Here we go. <laughs> So the great idea is, well, you know, I will add a delay, a uh, single tap delay that is written in the music. And unlike all of the imitative tradition, it's not linked to the beat. It's outside what the beat is. Uh, and then it will sound like uh, a delay and not like an imitation. So next piece. But now multi-tap. So not only uh, the lines are imitating each other, but some of them are kind of sample and whole and just get a little bit of, of the thing. And ideally, it would sound as if somebody was operating some sort of delay unit, right? Um, all right, so how about the next? <laughs> So the idea is, well, what needs to be, what's important is that because there's no harmony, the melody needs to be really, really rich in all sort of things. And because all the verticality is derived from the echoes and the echoes are not by the beat, so, but they are like by some different tap unit. Um, uh, that's what it's going to do. And that's what's going to get me to have my own procedures different from the echo procedures of Gabrielli or, or, or even the micropolyphony of, of, of Ligeti. Um, and the idea starts being, well, we may need to highlight what the source is. In this case, it is soprano sax. And I put numbers to see what tap is each of the appearances of the echo. That's crazy. <laughs> So I, I get a commission to do a, a tango concerto grosso because of course I am Alejandro, therefore from Argentina, you have to write tango, um, uh, you know, and I'm not going to say no, right? <laughs> Whenever somebody asks me for music, even if it's not what I want to write, you know, I need to take it. Um, so the idea became, well, uh, how about instead of having a melody, what I use to, to uh, add, effects is a found object. So I compose some sort of song, in this case in the tango style, and that's where I apply. So there is some polyphony, there is some harmony, but the harmony is 
comes with the previous material. It's not something that appears on the, on the, on the piece. Of course, I wrote everything, but, but that's a concept. And this one has a very nice um, uh, simulated uh, flanger effect. Where is this ideologically? Well, I, I would say, look, the music that, that you hear underneath, it's just normal music. It's not like real avant-garde stuff. What I am bringing to the table is all of these procedures, right? And that, because, because I thought then, and you might imply that, I might imply that I don't think that now, um, that, uh, um, well, that's what, what really matters, to have your own technique, um, so, and that technique, and that's what comes next, can operate under different styles and surfaces. So, you know, oh, and there's another thing that I learned from Reich. If you... of the elements so it's less just cloudy other effects or I'm stuck doing delays and chorus and echo well how about made up effects like the 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 turntable who runs out of electricity and then slows down and as as the speed slows down the pitch slows down <laughs> What if we start working on loops, but loops cut? I was, you know, trying on the computer, and sometimes they, 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 they wouldn't cut well. You would hear the imperfections in how you're cutting them if you're not exactly 4 4. Well, I can imitate that on orchestral writing. How about that? <laughs> And again, that uh, power outage effect. And uh, on that piece, every time that got played, uh, you know, uh, uh, there was a chuckle. And then and, um, this is a piece that's very interesting because that's where I thought, okay, I got it. This is, this is it. And since conceptually the technique, it all works out. I'm in this 
uh, album with these illustrious composers um, and, and monster players. And this is about, again, imperfect loops and all sort of different manipulations that imitate electronics, but they are written down. And, and, and you'll see that. Then more imitation. of electronics, in this case, imitating what a, a granular sampler would do to a bossa nova that I would write myself, right? Changing the window size, changing the grain size, and changing the density of the grains. And that image would allow me to imagine things that otherwise I wouldn't be able to imagine. <laughs> At some point, I was thinking, look, uh, um, have any male composers under 40, what they do, I mean, what we did, or what I did, and everybody else, and is this, right? Is show my technique, you know, it's really fireworks of technique and, and, and creativity and that, and that's, I thought was missing one of the points. Um, and, and you see it, you see it in Bartok. You know, Bartok in the 20s is harsh in a way that in his 20s, but Bartok when he's uh, older is not. Um, uh, and, and I thought that there was, a, there was an element of, of communication that was missing if all that I was doing was, you know, playing games of. Um, of, of fancy, right? So one of the things that I found very important is that I should analyze my listening habits and try to see whether I could write music that matches the music I would, I would listen to, right? And I, re I started realizing that some of the things that I thought I liked and some of the composers I thought I liked I never listened to, and um, and I was wondering why. And 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 one one of the things that I was interested in is accessibility from the point of view of of audio sound. Right? There's music that you cannot listen to unless it's on headphones, windows closed, without if you don't have kids, and otherwise it's impossible. You cannot you you cannot listen to say Bevern on your car, or in my car at least. Maybe if you have a fancy car, you could. But uh, in my car, you cannot listen to Weber. I didn't want my music to be fragile in that sense. So um, uh, what can I do? And the other thing that I was interested in, what can I do to get people to be able to experience my work, and myself to be able to experience my work, at different levels of attention? There is music that if you don't pay full attention, 100%, it is terrible. All, the only way to appreciate it is to be 100% paying attention and knowing what you're doing and looking at the score. And I didn't want my music to have that type of fragility. So can I write music that could be listened to without full attention and still be somehow partially appreciated? And that's where I was starting to go with this uh, concerto, where the effects start taking a back seat.
this orchestra music, what can I, will it sustain if played by a smaller group? <laughs> transcribe a lot of my orchestra music to a combo that I was playing in and see whether, you know, is that still good music or it depends to have 42 instruments, 72 reflections of echoes and things. Is that what really the music, the, the important part of the music is? Um, and I remember the Stravinsky thing in which what really matters is not necessarily the surface, but the calligraphy. And the calligraphy is inside everything else. So I started thinking, to declutter the music. I started realizing that there is a dimension in the communication with the musician and the embracing of the musician, of the performer, of the piece when there is an opening for an interpretation of it. And I don't mean outsourcing, like, you know, you, I give you the pitches and you tell me whether it's piano or forte. Uh, it's a music that the musician can interpret in ways that are, you know, the ways they learned to do. Um, and how you give him a long note and suddenly that long note has, has a life that, that, that is brought by the, the, the involvement of the musician in the interpreted part because the, the music allows it. more or less on this piece when, when I understood why I was listening to my music now more than, more than before and it's creating some sort of dynamic stasis that's cut through by long melodic lines and I have been doing long melodic lines forever it's just that now instead of cluttering them with stuff I just create some sort of dynamic non-motion um, uh, to it.
So now I have a, a bunch of other pieces that I haven't recorded yet, but since then. But uh, that's the basic gist of, of how I approached coming up with my own quote unquote voice, not by keeping one style over and over, but to allowing the techniques inside that style to evolve independently of what the surface is. Um, so um, I have now some, uh, uh, I'd like to get a little bit into some passages of, of some of these pieces, but I'd like to um, open for questions and comments and requests. And uh, I haven't read the, the, the chat, but um, uh, I'm opening the floor. Um, I had a question from something you said about with the delaying. Um, can you explain like how you did that, like outside the beat or something? You said something like that. Yes. Like, for example, one of the things that was very important for me is that a delay should not be an imitation. Right. If we do imitation, I say hello and then you say hello. There are two sources. But if I say hello and it bounces off the wall, we hear hello. Right? Therefore, there's one source and a number of reflections. Um, the, the, but the other thing is that when you have a, a, a delay or a digital delay, you could program how many taps or imitations you want and at which interval of time. And what I was doing is that the interval of time should not correspond with, say, the egg note. So it could be, you know, uh, a, a, a quarter note a quarter of, of a triplet. So, and, and the second, the other tap would have a different interval. Uh, therefore, what you don't have is and sometimes the, that would also change with time. Sometimes the tap time or the interval time between different taps would get longer and longer. Sometimes it would shorter and shorter. You know, I was trying to do all sort of things to just not make it a mechanical uh, uh, imitation. Anything else? Anything you disagree with? Were, uh, you, con were you concerned at all with like you said, you had to were commissioned the tango, and you had these other pieces that were tangos and bossa novas and all these different stylistic, you know, regional stylistic music. Were you concerned that this technique would impact certain rhythms that make that style happen? Because even listening, you it still sounded like a tango. It still sounded like a bossa. I'm just curious as to how you thought um, this applied to that and what you did with that. Well, I always used those. Star, known style and and you know I have been playing in tango ensembles forever so I know how to play them and I know how to write them and I know how to translate them to Americans right um, so for example you never play in tango the way it's written you play it in a different way well I write it in the way you're supposed to play it okay. uh, uh, because otherwise you need people who are in the know just like in jazz right um, a, and I always thought of those styles as found objects. So I, I took the found object, which I composed myself, but, but I, I, I used it as a found object and then started playing around with it as if I were just moving knobs and that would change things, but the found object is already there. Um, okay, oh, there's a question here. So hold on. In, uh, you mentioned there's overemphasis on technique innovation was tied to kind of toxic, I didn't say toxic, uh, masculinity in the contemporary classical music. Have you encountered technique innovation communities that you feel are doing it in a healthier way? How so? Um, no, no, because I, I, I or, or yes, I don't know. I think that uh, when you, older composers, <laughs> um, um, you know, the more you know, the less dogmatic you become, unless you're a Charles Warren. Um, uh, but um, I don't, I, you know, it's a great question, but I don't, I don't think I have a, a good answer. 
and 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 you know I didn't mean to demean all my my fellow uh, male composers, uh, but it's something that I have noticed and I have noticed in myself. Uh, you know, there the, the, the oh, look at me. You know, I'm 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 really smart and I'm really you know that's something that we have built in in our youth um, in sports and everything like that and. Some of that, you know, it's energy that you need to be able to to um, to direct in a way in a way that's not toxic, right? But um, it's a good it's a good it's a good question. Anything else? I have a question. Yes. Um, how much does a particular instrument or orchestration play into thematic concepts um like your earlier styles when you were talking about the singularity of a line and then in later compositions how you started to highlight a single line let's hypothetically say you had a string quartet plus a clarinet how would that clarinet in terms of its difference or just the way it functions as an instrument are there any you know, values like uh, thin and delicate that you assert on the instrument um, when creating this, or is everything kind of subservient to a, a greater process? If that makes sense, I don't. <laughs> Hello. Hello. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Thank you. Yes. Well, no, I saw your message. Uh, no. All right, hang tight for a few minutes, everyone. You lost me for a second. Hello, hello. Yes. yes, we can hear Super. you. Yes, sorry, I I, I was out. Hey, hey, hey. Hey, what were what was the question? Okay, I was asking how much does an instrument play a role in kind of your thematic development? Uh, I use the example of a string quartet plus a clarinet uh, for the example of does that clarinet innately you know have a certain quality to you like um let's say oh the clarinet to me is a nostalgic instrument and so when paired with the string quartet let me really enhance the inherent qualities of nostalgia or is everything kind of subject to an idea like in your earlier works uh when you were talking about the concept of a singular line transforming you know uh across the whole instrumentation or uh, even in your later works where the line drives something. I just kind of wanted to hear your like mental priority in terms of instruments and orchestration when developing a concept for a piece, say. That's a, gr that's a great question because the truth is that it was a, a, it revealing to me um, when I was doing all these echoes and stuff, um, I, I liked equal sounding uh, groups, like string quartets were perfect, um, double of everything, large ensembles, and, and you know, there would be no chance in hell I would be able to write something for guitar, right, alone. Um, uh, so that definitely affected instrumentation. And, and that was also one of the things that when I, when I started saying, okay, you have all these pieces for orchestra, uh, you know, get, they get played once in a while. Uh, 
what can I, I mean, would that music, sort the music, the core of the music survive, which has played four of us. Um, and the other thing is that I started to um, want to play more uh, of my music and write music that, uh, you know, essentially I could play. And, and, and I have a few things to show where I became more and more involved in playing my own music. And that changed, that changed everything. Yes, but essentially, m let me put it this way. My ideologically, my ideological stubbornness on the technique prevented me from actually attempting certain instrumentations because they wouldn't fit. Um, in any case, it was useful. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. All right, so let me show you, uh, let me get, get inside a few of these pieces a little bit. Um, uh, let me share a screen. Oh, sorry. Uh, there is, there is, a, there is a. Oh, can you elaborate on dynamic stasis? Yes. So, um, let's think of stasis, right? A long drone, and nothing happens, right? And then you improvise on the Dorian, and after a while, it just gets boring, or you need to really slow down time. You know, it's it it's it's static. But it doesn't move. Think, think about a drum circle. You go to a drum circle and suddenly, you know, they're playing the same patterns over and over and over, but it doesn't get boring. You keep engaged because there's so many interactions that repeat over a long period of time that essentially, you know, there is a dynamic, dynamic uh, nature of this stasis that doesn't get uh, boring. It's like some sort of elaborate uh, riff or, or groove in a way. And, and, and that is something that doesn't change expressively, that doesn't evolve, but it's not uh, flat and it's not, you know, it, it moves. So let me go to um, a, this piece. which, uh, you know, I was always very proud of it. Um, and let me tell you what, what you're going to hear, right? So what you're going to hear is first, in the first three bars, it tells you, oh, this is going to be about loops. And then on the first, on the 30 seconds afterwards, it's going to show you the song in some sort of fake South American urban jazzier folk style, but with a lot of detail. And then I'm, we're going to start looping it in crazy ways. And, and, and to me, that was a crystallization of a lot of effort in developing the internal calligraphy for this. So here we go. Here.
Uh -huh. and, and as you can see, if it gets an octave higher, it goes twice as fast. And, and the same with the intervals, right? And all sort of of of, of games uh, that that it, it require a lot of effort to write and require a lot of effort to play. These are monster players, um, uh, but in any case, this is a recent piece, and it's the it's it's kind of the the, the opposite. This is something I wrote last year, and um, um, it's where I wanted no games, and I just wanted to make everything incredibly transparent and where the line as usual is moving and there is some sort of dynamic stasis in a way I'll, we'll, we'll listen to a little bit of it uh where are you hold on one second wow coming back coming back here we go. What you can see is that um, uh, we always know what to listen to. There aren't too many things for us to get lost and miss the detail that, that I want 
uh, us to listen to. Um, and I, I, I had a friend who was a producer who said, okay, look, even in rock and roll or whatever it is, you go from, we, have, we can listen to one thing at a time. So I, I mix it, so it goes from the hi-hat to the guitar, to the voice, to the bass, to the snare, to something like that. And I wanted to think of this, like one whole listening thing where you're never missing something. Um, questions, anything? Move on to the next. Uh, I do have a question. Um, can, you, can, you, can you hear me? Yes. So, um, the when you think about the difference between your the the surface elements of your music versus what you can, would consider your calligraphy, did you consciously think of that as you evolved, or did you look back and notice what was always there in terms of? Does that make sense? Yeah. Uh, yes. At some point, I noticed. But one of the, one of the, the, at some point I noticed that something was there, but one of the things and one of the procedures I use and I encourage my students to use, and I know that there is one of my former students here there, uh, she'll know, um, is I, I find the 10 seconds of my previous piece that I like the best. I try to find out why I like it. And then I write it again in a different musical context. And then I like it again, I write it again in a different musical context. And we normally have a repertoire of things. You know, what do you do in this situation? What do you do in that situation? So we have, a, a, you know, a bunch of things that, that are part of our style. And I go and say, okay, for a fast part, I like those five seconds. I'll write them again in my next piece. Uh, but different. 20 paces later, you have a procedure, you have a way of operating that is totally yours even though sometimes it's really hard to know what it is um, that's why sometimes when we discuss thank you uh, Lansing so, so when we discuss style you, we focus on external things you know the scales that you use the harmonies the, the formal procedures and I've never I have not shown you a complete piece because I don't really believe in form that much um, I think that what really matters is each of each of the moments and what are those moments uh, uh, constructed or made of, um, yeah, you have to do a good form so it doesn't lag. But, but, but yes, that's a great question. Uh, that, that, have I answered it? Uh, no, absolutely. Actually, better than I expected anyone to be able to. The the idea that you know those those uh, those moments because you know I think anyone who continues to be a composer after the first couple years of trying must have gone back. And and listen to some of the things they read, wrote and and found those moments where you're like hey I and th those four measures I got it, and I I guess I never consciously like you articulated I guess what I have done, which is go back and like oh that was the cool moment in this piece what if I build on that in the next one you know what I mean, and that's just that's really helpful to to actually articulate the way you just said so thank you short answer to this talk meaning that's how you that's how you create your style and that requires so many iterations of doing the same thing multiplied by a number of things multiplied by the times that it takes 20 years okay. right. um, all right so um a little bit of um this piece uh, hold on where are you And I need to play it from let me five twenty four. And this is where dynamic stasis is. Um, it's page twenty two on the score. I think. No, it's not page twenty. Hold on, one second. Page thirteen. And, and you see, you know, this is going to be like one groove, uh, but the groove internally is pretty complex, but it doesn't evolve or it doesn't have um, uh, edges. So in a sense, it's static, but 
but it moves. And uh, this is a 15-4, which I, I, I lived for a year in the island of St. Lucia, and I noticed that some, I played with some of the jazz and folk musicians over there. Um, and uh, I noticed that sometimes I use this beat, which is really hard to count because I do it 15-4, which is a five in, in compound, slow. <laughs> a slow five in compound where the drum set, the snare goes in between two and three of the big beats. It's amazing. So I try to recreate this. Etc. So what you you see you see here that uh, there's it's always a long melody and one of the the thing is that if the melody if a line doesn't last thirty seconds you know it's not it's not long enough. Um, 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 all right. So the, uh, something is somebody saying. Oh, uh, Anthony says, what you leave behind defines the piece. What you take to the next defines the voice, perhaps. Yeah, that was in response to a few comments just before mine, actually. We need to avoid doing the cool things we've done before. Um, perhaps, yes, but, 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 but you know, we, we can build on them, right? Um, you, you know, Bill Evans kind of repeats some of his licks, right? Uh, um, but yes, I agree. Some composers just, you know, just print music like, uh, um, uh, yeah, that's, that's, that's really interesting conversation. Um, so that brings me to the thing that, you know, I, I, I wanted to be myself in the center of, of my music making. So I, you know, I started writing pieces where, where I am in it. So now. <laughs> And then, you know, 
uh, many years, uh, a few, uh, four or five years ago, I discovered the instrument that I started with, the, the electric bass. Uh, so. couldn't have written or play or written this piece without myself playing it and I wouldn't have allowed myself to write music like this when I, my idea of what music was was about the big idea and big novel technique that is proprietary right uh, as opposed to what your DNA as a musician is in the same way in which we could get the DNA of Beethoven on one chord, right? And we can get the DNA of John Bonham's drum sound on one lick. Um, so uh, I started, you know, playing as much as possible. And here's a, um, a, 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 I play also as a sideman. Here's, I'm, I'm, I'm here arranging and, 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 and playing on. Si fui rico, si fui honrado, si hubo seras en mi cuna, a nadie importa quién soy yo, de dónde vengo, y si alguno se me acerca, me pregunta cuánto tengo, mira los trapos que te latan de pobreza de hoy. Y en esos trapos le etc. etc. So um, anything that brings me uh, to a stage, to play, to I used to be a conductor, uh, helps me you know, organize uh, uh, things. Um, questions, comments? I mean, this has been, it's been wonderful uh, for me uh, talking to you. You have been really interesting questions, really interesting conversations. Anything else that you, you'd like to discuss? Um, it's all open. Fantastic. Yeah. That was awesome. Thank you. Um, I was curious as to whether you think your like stylistic development, your stylistic work, is done, and that you are happy exactly where you are, or if you want to keep changing your style, keep updating it, keep finding new elements for it. I will definitely keep update, updating because because the truth is, you know, I, I haven't written the perfect piece <laughs> i need to keep trying uh, there are always uh, you know 10 great seconds sometimes 20 seconds and 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 uh, i want all the music to be always all spectacular um and so now yeah it's going to be it's it's going to change it's going to but the one thing and that's one thing that i think is proper of the united states that doesn't happen elsewhere this is probably the only country where you could just find a way to do whatever the hell you want and not be under a, uh, you know, under the the the, the world view, and of whoever is uh, in position of a musical power, right? Um, so that's kind of liberating. Somebody, uh, Alexander, is asking me, being from South America, can you speak about how you feel about Ariel Ramirez and if he had any influence on your work? Ariel Ramirez is a folk artist and composer who um, 
crossed over a little bit into into classical. Uh, he has a, a piece that's very famous called the Misa Criolla. Um, I like uh, Ramirez's songs, uh, uh, um, Alexander. Um, I'm not crazy about the the crossover thing uh, because he loses the spark. In in my view, he loses the spark uh, of of the of the folk aspect that he does so well. I mean, he's a, a, he was, I think, uh, or oh yes, uh, an incredible musician. But I wasn't looking at him for this mixing and because you know i used to play rock and i used to conduct choirs and i used to conduct the string orchestras and then orchestras and then everything gets mixed up um now uh, in a way that's probably freer than it used to be in ramirez's generation uh i was wondering if Go ahead. ask a question about um when you were talking about style and this idea of sort of like the calligraphy of the composer and sort of, I was thinking about the idea of that like compositional intuition mm -hmm. and like how that relates to style. But also, um, I also one time had this lesson um, and this, this composer told me um, about the importance of making sure not to get in this trap of just like always composing within this sort of uh, as, as he described it, this com compositional in intuitive realm. Otherwise, you'll start to find yourself in a cycle. You're not introducing anything novel. You're not breaking away from that. And the, I wanted to know what you thought about the importance of breaking away from intuition to develop style. Uh, I think it's, 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 let me put it this way. It's very easy for me to say, oh, break away from the novelty, um, uh, after I have been after novelty for 20 years, right? So building, I mean, looking for the novelty is what allowed me to develop a technique. And once I realized that I had that technique, I realized I didn't need the novelty. Ah. Otherwise, how do you, but, but you have to have a way yeah. of developing the technique. And, and I was always having some sort of rabbit that I had to chase that would force me to imagine things that otherwise I wouldn't have been able to imagine, right? For example, how do I do a, a imitation of a granular sampling process? Well, that's not something that would come natural to me sitting at the piano or at the bass, right? Um, I had to work at it a lot. And after I worked at it, I found some things that worked and I incorporated that into my, my my penmanship um, uh, so um, or the piece that I decided to write for for band that I decided to compose just electronically so I wrote a song with, uh, with guitar and then I started recording a completely electronic crazy electronic not not EDM but crazy electronic sounds floating around etc etc and it's okay I'll score it I'll score this to for for wind ensemble and see how it plays out and it was really hard because it was really hard to get those sounds into instrumental sounds but that forced me to get the technique of if i want this sound translated into a wind ensemble you know now i know <laughs> um, um so uh, you know i think you may, you, you bring a great point uh, it's, it's totally great to chase those technique rabbits because they're going to, there's something that help you. Um, uh, I love that toolbox. So that's right, get the toolbox. But also it's very important to analyze your music after you wrote it as if it was somebody else's and, and see what can you get out of that. Um, uh, John is asking if you can re-articulate why you find it important to perform your own compositions, would you recommend that other composers perform their own comp works or is it a pref personal preference? Of course, it is a personal preference, but the one thing that I, I found really important is that sometimes when we're composing and we are not involved in the act of performing our music, we don't experience what happens to somebody who's performing it. And what sometimes happens, and it definitely happened to my music a lot, 
is that the efforts of creating, of, of, of playing what you wrote is such in terms of, you know, the rhythms, the co coordination, this, that there's no room left, no, no CPU <laughs> left in the brain of a musician to bring the level of emotional contact, you know, and, and, and playing yourself thing, uh, was it, do I really need those 64th notes in this passage? I mean, are they, isn't it better without it? And, and one of the things that I have been doing, and I did in the, pre in the piece that Hypercube is going to play, is that instead of giving them a MIDI version of, of, of a mock-up, I played it. Right? I, I got myself a, a hi-hat and, and something else, uh, and I played the, the, the percussion part. I, got, I played the guitar part on bass. I played the piano part. I couldn't play the saxophone part. I wish I, I played an instrument, uh, a wind instrument to, to emulate that. And in the process of making the mock-up, I discovered, I made so many edits, so many edits that I say, yeah, yeah you know, this, this thing doesn't really make sense. Um, and it, it's about just going and, 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 and streamlining what is important of the music. And, and in that, I found that, that playing with your music really helps. And this bass solo, uh, I decided to compose it without writing it. So I composed it, I played it, I played it three or four times live, plus many times <laughs> private. And only when I was final, when I was making the video, and after I made the video, I wrote it down. Because what happens is that sometimes you have an idea and you write it down. And once you wrote it down, you're married to it. I mean, it's, it's a lot of work to edit it. I mean, it's okay. Uh, and, and if you see what happens with a, with a band, they have a, the material for their next album and they play it and it sounds okay. They go on tour for a year. After a year, it's smoking. So what I wanted to do is to write down the piece, not when I compose it, but when it's smoking, right? A year later, in this case, it was like f f four months later, after I played it. And I, I, you know, I, I, I wish I had waited one more year and I just write it down next year because now I'm too lazy to, well, not too lazy, but I'm not really willing to rewrite it. But as you play it, you discover, oh, I could add this thing, and I could add an ornament here, and I could uh, change this harmony here, and suddenly it's a better piece. And in that sense, being your own performer really, really helps. And, and I remember this, when Messien was composing, uh, uh, on the first rehearsal, Yvonne Loriot, which he was, uh, uh, she was um, Messien's wife, was a very good, very good organist, would sit in the back <laughs> and uh, would write down all the things he needed to change, right? We don't have uh, the luxury of multiple rehearsals, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, um, somebody asks, I really love the title of the piece. I often struggle to come up with titles that are creative or interesting enough to stand out. What do you think about the creating the title of the piece? Um, a piece goes through at least seven different titles before I settle on something. Um, and I, because I try to link the music that I write with some sort of idea from somewhere, in some way, right? For example, the piece for bass, down with those guitars, is uh, essentially a cry of independence of the six-string electric bass uh, from those guitars. Uh, and uh, Lansing wrote uh, Titles Matter, <laughs> which means, you know, that's the, the interface between us and possibly somebody clicking, hey, how about that? In, the piece that you're going to hear from um, Hypercube, uh, Forget Books to Who the, and uh, Grab That Banjo, uh, you know, it, I could, it's a long explanation. Books to Who the, to me, I mean, for organists, it's a, it's a household name, but to me, it represents everything that's wrong about the classical music industry, right? They are really uh, spending money on programming second rate dead composers from the past. They should spend that money programming second-rate living composers from the present, us, right? Um, I mean, we cannot compete with the, with the Four Seasons, with Beethoven Fifth, but, you know, I'd rather listen to any of us 
than Brooks Yehude, who is, who is by, by the way, a good composer. Um, so um, in a way, and grab that banjo. I mean, the banjo is to me the, the a metaphor for informality, right? Uh, and also to hide those, those two things are hiding the fact that in the music there is neither Brooks Yehude nor banjo music in any way and to distract you from getting the references that there might be. So yes, I, I work very, very hard at titles and you know, English is my second language so I don't even speak it uh, well. So sometimes I get into um, uh, some sort of um, involuntary poetry, right? <laughs> but, uh, but what can I do? Uh, and there's one more here, following with the previous conversation, I'm interested to hear your insights about style and habit. Would other possibilities be hindered if we are mindful about our unique thinking process that makes our pieces sound like us? Perhaps, perhaps, but I think that the, the positive that you get about being mindful outstrip, uh, outvalue the risks of not being mindful. And one of the ways in which sometimes I, I, um, I try to avoid getting in the traps of my own thinking process is once in a while, write a piece that nobody asks for that is something totally different that has nothing to do with the way you operate. And it's going to be a flawed piece, it's going to be a bad piece, whatever it is, but it's going to be one crazy thing. Um, it, it, it doesn't matter if it's like, you know, just throwing microphones into the air and shooting them with lasers and then record, uh, I don't know, whatever it is that you, that, that you don't usually do, occasionally try it um, to liberate yourself. And maybe there are five seconds there that will trigger a chain reaction that 10 years later is going to make, uh, make a difference. All right, hey, this is really great. Thank you all very, very much. Uh, it's been a blast. Thank you all uh, also uh, the, for the, the oldies, uh, for their, their wisdom and contributions. <laughs> um, and and um, uh, I'll be around in this, uh, in this thing. Um, looking forward to all the events. Thank you.